Hi, everyone. Welcome to this week's podcast marking the second week in Autism Awareness Month. In honor of this, I wanted to highlight a study that focused not on people with autism, but of the siblings of people with autism. It was just published in the Journal of Autism and Developmental Disorders. Catherine Walton and Brooke Ingersoll recruited siblings of individuals with autism and siblings of people without autism. They also talked to their parents and focused on how the sibling was doing and how it affected their relationship with their sibling. In this study, the investigators looked at adjustment and relationships in these siblings by asking several questions. First, are there differences in the broader autism phenotype characteristics in these siblings? Are there emotional and behavioral difficulties? And what are the sibling relationship characteristics like? Are there specific risk factors for some behavioral and emotional difficulties? And lastly, are there a model that can predict behavioral and emotional problems or sibling relationship problems? The investigator used some tools like the social responsiveness scale to measure the broader autism phenotype and the strengths and differences questionnaire, and mothers filled out a survey about their own depressive symptoms and things that were going on at home. The results? Overall, the siblings overall didn't show increased levels of adjustment difficulties, but there were some differences in subgroups. For example, in older brothers of children with autism, 60% of them had some sort of behavioral or emotional problem. That's almost double that of the typically developing sibling group. The authors state that clinicians working with families of children with autism should be alert for possible difficulties in siblings, particularly older brothers, and should be prepared to offer additional family-based services or make appropriate referrals when indicated. Siblings are in need of resources and instruction about how to appropriately engage their sibling in play in order to foster more and frequent successful sibling interactions. Also, this study showed some strengths of siblings with children with autism, which is nice to see. They demonstrated higher levels of social behavior and lower levels of aggression in their sibling relationship in comparison to siblings of typically developing children. The findings suggest that the experience of having a sibling with autism may sensitize typically developing siblings to the needs of others, and that they're aware and adjust to their siblings' unique needs within the relationship. There was also some evidence that under certain conditions, siblings of children with autism were actually functioning better than siblings of typically developing children. I think that a parent could probably tell you the same thing, but this study provides specific evidence and recommendations on how to take the good and the bad together. This week, re researchers also revealed more information about the changes over time in the brains of people with autism. You know, research using postmortem brain tissue has shown that the nature of the differences across life of someone with autism compared to those without autism changes. It doesn't necessarily get better or worse, it just changes. For example, the brain is not as plastic and malleable with age in individuals with autism. A new analysis out of the University of Miami also comes to the same conclusion with a bit of a twist. They analyzed existing data from a data repository on brain imaging. This is a great use of time and resources because the data is already there. The patients have already completed the study, and the information just needs to be sorted out. The focus here was on connectivity within different regions of the brain and across the brain. You probably remember me discussing studies that showed that in some regions of the brain, the connection between brain regions are overactive. Across other regions of the brain, the connections are not active enough. I'll admit, sometimes the studies have conflicting results, which actually isn't surprising given how different symptoms can be and, of course, changes across time. So in order to resolve some of these conflicts, these scientists compared data from three groups of people with autism and compared it to those without autism, children, adolescents, and adults. In summary, the researchers found that children show too much connectivity across different regions of the brain, but not enough within key critical regions. These differences are not as stark in adolescents and adults. The fact that the di differences diminish across the lifespan could offer an explanation for some of the improved function found in adults with autism compared to children with autism, although clearly this isn't a complete explanation, as adolescents and adults in the study actually did exhibit some symptoms of autism. So measuring connectivity through Im imaging methods shouldn't be the be-all, end-all of autism research. What was also interesting that researchers confirmed an area of interest that has been found in other studies called the DMN or the default mode network. This consists of areas of the posterior cingulate cortex, the medial temporal lobes, and the medial prefrontal cortex. 
they showed that these areas are key to symptoms of autism, especially repetitive behaviors. So the replication of this finding indicates that it could possibly be a biological marker, and it should be studied in further autism research. That's it for the science this week, but during Autism Awareness Month, I'll be making a suggestion about things to do to support research. One thing that's important for individuals, parents, and siblings to do is participate in autism research. A genetic study last year showed that through an analysis of the number of new findings is directly related to the number of samples available for study. But don't think this is limited to just autism genetics. It applies to every area of research. So if you want to get involved in research, one good way to do this is to go to the Interactive Autism Network, and I'll provide a link included in the comments, and register. You can be contacted about new studies in your area. And another way to support Autism Awareness Month is to come to the Day of Learning supported by the Autism Science Foundation. There will be seven TED-style talks given by leaders in autism research covering areas like gender differences, services, science communication, and helping people care for themselves. Register online, and we're looking forward to seeing you there. Talk to you next week.